So real world HVAC systems, I want to tell you, you guys, a lot of you know this already. They're not perfect. They're not installed correctly. They're not ducted correctly. They're not charged correctly. They don't get enough air. They get too much air. The duct's too small or too large. It's not made correctly. It leaks. They left the door off of it. Gas pressure is not right. Too high, too low. Use the wrong piping. There's all sorts of things that lead to a job not being done correctly. There is no job out there that is 100% perfect. It's not possible. Number two says you, it can't be made perfect. You're not going to do anything perfectly out there in the field. And if you can kind of grasp that, you know that it doesn't matter who you are. You're going to hit those stumbling blocks along the way, but you'll be able to understand this stuff and reason through it. And one, of the, you just got to stop, slow down, gain some information, not panic. Just be there in the moment saying, okay, let me see if I can understand why this isn't working. And that's what I'm going to try to do here. The idea is to get some confidence, go up there and use your reasoning and use the information that you've gathered and be able to understand why something's not performing correctly and take the parameters which you measure, which is one thing that's big. you got to measure something to know what it does or if it's working. If you don't measure it, how do you know? And that's, hey, that's the old statement. What was that? Eddie Leverage's, if you ain't measuring, you're guessing. Maybe that was True Tech Tools. I don't remember, but someone said that. And uh, it is true. So don't go in there thinking that uh, you're just going to wave your hand over something. You can hear a whistling in the grills. All these are information that you can use, but you have to verify that. If you don't measure it, it's only something that you assume is happening. So you have to have the numbers to back it up, especially when you're trying to justify explaining it and justification to a customer or to your boss, because he's going to know, okay, is it low in air? How much air was there? Or maybe he doesn't. Not all bosses can grasp this information. Some of them aren't even built for the service side. They're just bosses. They're management that don't understand, but it doesn't make it any less important because your confidence will be boosted by knowing this stuff. And your customer will say, hey, this guy just said a whole bunch of numbers. He must be right. I had plenty of customers that I'm pretty sure had no idea what I was talking about, but uh, and that's my fault. Soft skills training was skipped for me. But they understood that I was measuring and taking it seriously, and that mattered just as much as if they understood it, evidently. <laughs> All right. Let's go to number two here. Hey, Real-world HVAC systems almost always have duct issues. There is no duct system on the planet Earth that is good enough or perfect. I will say good enough. We'll say perfect. They cannot be perfect. Humans cannot create a perfect anything. You know, we can go to the Bible study and learn that. Humans are not perfect, and they'll never be perfect. Not down here, anyway. There's going to be duct issues. There's going to be leaking in the duct system. No duct system is 100% tight. You can get pretty daggone close, and... 99.9% .9 if you're really taking your time with it, but not a whole lot of people really take their time with a duct system. You might have a guy out there just masticing one inch of goop, which is what we call mastic, where I come from, putting goop all over the ductwork until you can't even see any cracks. But you know what? It might be perfect in that moment or very close, but you know, electrician's going to crawl under it. Electrician's going to drill through it. Electricians are bad. That's what I'm trying to say. Plumbers are going to drill through it. They're going to kick takeoffs off the duct so they can run a plumbing pipe or something. Things are going to happen to it. So even if it's close to perfect at the beginning, it's going to get worse and worse as time goes on. It's uh, I think it's the principle of entropy. It's never going to get... <laughs> and uh, I like to chat over there. It says, doggone. Is that an industry term? You better believe it. On this show, it is. Number two. Duck systems and ACs. AC is what I'm referred to with number two. They're sized outside of tolerances. All right, what does sizing outside of tolerances mean? Well, manual J gives you a leeway. And we'll just say it's plus or minus. We'll say it's plus or minus 10%. That's a little bit less than it used to be. Because on one side, it's plus or minus 15%. But you get it. It's 10% is your leeway. So if you have an air conditioner, because air conditioners aren't made in every single BTU size, you have half tonnages for the most part. 
unless it's multi-stage because multi-stage can compensate a little bit for that. So you have your half tonnages. You have your load calculation, which someone hopefully did in your company. They say it's 36,000 BTUs of load on a structure. So you put in a three-ton unit. Well, three ton units very rarely operate at exactly thirty thousand or thirty six thousand BTUs, so you're going to have a particular matchup of a system. Let's say it's thirty four thousand. Ten percent of thirty four thousand is three thousand four hundred, so you're within the tolerance there. A lot of people are not. A lot of people go overboard. It's like I, I need to make sure this house cools. So even though it says thirty six thousand on the summary here at the load calculation, I'm going to I'm going to put in a three and a half just to make sure get them through those real hot days, which seems like you're doing a good thing, but it's not, it's not a good thing because oversized air conditioners cause a lot of problems. So you want to try to hit the sweet spot. Being slightly undersized is to me a good thing because at least you're not going to air on the side of a house being incredibly humid. You'll have it be able to dehumidify just a little bit better through runtime. And that means a smaller system is going to have to run more to do the same thing as a properly sized system. So 10%, either way, it's kind of hard to find that in the field. 50%, more like it sometimes. Real-world HVAC systems almost always are not properly charged. Very rarely did I see a system that I went to service and it had a perfect charge. It may have been close, and there were some I didn't have to touch because there are tolerances for that, too. Let's say you were working on a TXV system that called for 9 degrees of subcooling, and that TXV would produce 12 degrees of superheat at the outdoor unit, which usually means it was at 10% or 10%, 10 degrees at the evaporator exit. Talking about a split system here. Well, subcooling changes throughout the cycle. And, for example, if you have a very hot day and they turn the AC off and they turn it back on, see what happens is the TXV opens and closes. And on a very hot day, when that coil kicks into action, the superheat's going to be potentially really high because it's going to struggle because the air coming across the coil is very hot. So basically, it's going to take that refrigerant in there and boil it real fast. And it's going to heat it up beyond that 10 degrees of superheat exiting the evaporator. So what happens? The TXV sensing this through a little bulb on it says, okay, it's too warm leaving the evaporator. So I'm going to open up. And the TXV opens up and refrigerant pours into the evaporator, bringing the superheat down. But what happened is the, the channel between the high side of the system and the low side just grew because the TXV opened up. So the subcooling is formed because that liquid refrigerant stacks before the TXV. So if the TXV opens, more refrigerant flows through, subcooling is going to come down. So on a really hot day, if it's 90 degrees in the house, your target subcooling might be 9, but what you get might be 3 or 4 because the TXV is open. So you have to account for that. And that's just that's a lot of different metering devices will act that way because they're trying to compensate for that high superheat heading back to the compressor, which is a compressor killer. They don't want the compressor to have 30 degrees of superheat coming back because by the time it spits it out on the other side, it could be 210, 220 degrees on the top of that compressor. And compressors do not like 220 degrees. That is the danger zone because 220 degrees is on the outside, the top. The inside is going to be warmer still. So it's very, very dangerous. Uh, we'll hit one more point here. I'll reflect back on the chat. We'll continue. Real-world HVAC systems almost always are not installed properly. We kind of been talking about that the whole time. They're put in without the proper adjustment kits, downflow. You ever see a downflow unit with a very special downflow kit installed out of S-Lock and some sort of angle? Well, that's because someone didn't order the downflow kit. Might have, might have done that a little bit in my day because downflow kits sometimes are not available for certain units. You have to order them. And if you're at a job and it's going, and you think you can make a kit that is very similar, which you can sometimes if you're a sheet metal person or just a person who has snips and hammer, you can sometimes make that kit a little bit of insulation. Don't forget that. Don't want to sweat. But things like that are left out all the time. 
thermostats are wired incorrectly. So the features of the unit don't operate properly. You ever seen Y1 and Y2 wire nutted together? So it runs in high all the time because somebody thought that was the solution to a problem. And maybe it worked a little bit better for some reason. Maybe they left it on Y1 and then they put a timer on Y2 because the house was real humid. So you want to drag out that cycle. Now, a lot of thermostats, you can adjust that too. But you see a lot of service techs in the field. I come from an older time when relays solved our problems. We didn't have thermostats that would think for us. We had to kind of design things with relays, which I think is a fun time to come from because you get a lot of, you know, fun ideas that way. Mm -hmm.